All right, we are live. Got a few guys in already. Cool. Nice. That's going to be fun. Huh? All right, so uh, I'm here at the shop with the mask. mask I'm at, at uh, home without. I'm very jealous. But, um, yeah, very happy to be here for uh, Self-Isolation, the sequel. Uh, round two, sweater. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of presenter, uh, presenters already booked for this sweater. bunch more to come. We're starting out with Matt Martin. Matt, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, awesome angler and fly tire as well. He's one of uh, Drift's um, tying pro staff. He is also a um, uh, recommended endorsed guide of us. He's going to be do some, doing some guiding and instructing with us this year if anyone wants to get out with him. He uh, does trout, carp, bass, steelhead, the whole whole thing. He's been a musky guide in a past life. Um, yeah, just all around super fishy guy. So today we're talking carp, right? We sure are, Chris. Yeah, thanks for that nice intro. Um, yeah, really looking forward to the upcoming season. Um, you know, it is middle of January right now. Um, normally this time of year, our lakes are frozen over, but uh, <laughs> not quite yet. Um, so, but I am starting to get bit by that carp bug, so to speak. Um, looking forward to those warm days, uh, wading around shallow, clear water, uh, and sight fishing for these monsters. Um, if anybody's been ever looking to, you know, you know, with, with spe specifically with travel being a bit tricky right now, they're looking to scratch that itch that they normally, you know, have when they're going for a bone fisher permit trip down south. Uh, this comes pretty close. Um, you are going to have lots of op opportunities. You're going to have lots of shots at fish, but they're hard. A lot of people think they're big, um, easy fish to catch, but for every, you know, dozen fish you'll present to, you may not even hook one. Um, you, you might take 20 or 30 fish before you touch a fish. Mm -hmm. And then they actually fight like pretty smart. They'll take you into cover. <laughs> They'll take 100 yard plus runs. Um, they'll test your gear to its limits and uh, it, it's really you can't really relate it to anything else but um, some flats fishing yeah. um, in, in Ontario so yeah I love um, you know there's this huge uh, growth right now a lot of people are looking to target new species um, as our you know local areas change and warm up you know we're not able to target trout in the middle of summer anymore um, carp are pretty resilient um, they do like cool water I feel like I found that you know, they do feed best in cooler temperatures. By cooler, I mean like in the 70s, 60s to 70s. It's, it's above that threshold for trout, which is nice. Um, so there's been many days I've started my mornings on the river and then gone down into lower sections and decided to go to the carp instead. Um, they're amazing adversaries. Uh, they, they, they're they picky. Uh, they fight hard. Um, and they're actually pretty cool looking fish. So uh, not much bad to say about them. Um, today we're going to go over uh, the, the techniques needed um, to make like the two primary areas I target carp uh, and about three different fly patterns uh, that I use on the regular. Um, so yeah, for our, um, if you were hearing paper wrestling, I had to write a bunch of notes so because there's a lot to talk about. Make sure I'm going over everything. Um, um, Basically, with, with carp, there's two areas that I target. Um, one of them is, like I stated before, like a shallow, rocky, flat uh, area, knee to waist deep water. Um, clear water is key, um, and so is a high sun. Uh, again, very similar to flats fishing. You want that bright sun. On a cloudy day, you can catch them, but you're not going to be able to see them at a far enough distance to make that nice, soft, gentle presentation uh, to those fish. Um, the other area I target is shallow, weedy flats, um, sometimes just enough to cover their backs in the water, 8, 10, 12 inches of water, uh, and you'll see them up there sunning themselves, um, feeding in the mud, um, and, and over those, those fish are, are a little bit easier to hook, I find, harder to land because the cover can be quite intense. Um, so when you say walking, with those sort of uh, like shallower kind of weedier environments, clarity in the water is maybe a little less important than the deeper, rockier. Definitely, yeah. You have more cover to hide yourself and your and, and your footprints uh, and how you're walking, you're stubbing your toe, whatever. Uh, you have a little bit more forgiveness in that soft bottom as well. It's quieter. Um, regardless of where you're fishing, if it's on flat, on rocky flat, or if it's in a weedy flat, weedy way back there. Um, the goal is to get as close as possible to these fish without spooking them. You can catch them on a 30, 40, 50 foot cast, definitely. Um, will they chase flies? Definitely. But oftentimes these fish just want something served right off to their left or their right, close to their head. Um, and if you were to make a 40 foot cast and try to place a fly there, 
you'll usually end up spooking the fish. Um, so getting in nice and close, approaching from behind if possible, if you can get from their tail fin, they have a little bit of a blind spot behind them. Um, and if you can get, there's been times I've taken friends that will attest to this, that you're pretty much under your rod tip times. And you can often do a technique that I even call like a reach and drop, um, which is similar to like a Euro thing technique where you're reaching out with a straight arm and you get a little extra distance and you're putting that fly inches off to the left or the right of the fish. And you'll, then, you'll notice I say left or the right. If you put it right in front of their nose, the way their eyes are situated, they can't actually see what's directly in front of their nose. So you can sit there and dangle it in front of their nose forever and they, they won't take it. But the minute you move it, it's two inches, three inches to the left. Um, those That fish, you'll see them, they aggressively turn and suck it up. Um, also working above them is a, is a good opportunity, good option as well. If you can get a fly that sinks slowly and you can present it over top of them as it comes down to them, you'll often see them rise up off the bottom and eat it. Um, and yeah, and then it's game on. Um, so when you're out there, the time of year is very important. These fish aren't up all year. Um, they're up for a good portion of this, the spring into early summer. Um, we start finding them in the shallow water. Uh, around you know early May, which can be pre-spawn temperatures for them, where they're quite aggressive. Um, they've come up out of the deep water where they winter and over, where they overwinter uh, to feed on crayfish. Um, and in the Great Lakes, where I'll be talking specifically, where I target them, um, they feed on gobies a lot too. Uh, so on bait fish, like a lot of people think they're just sucking up off the bottom and not chasing bait fish, but they will chase bait fish. Um, and they're coming up shallow. That's when I usually find them on the rocks. Um, and then when we work into into the spawn period, which is late May, early June, you'll see fish everywhere, but it's really hard to catch them. Um, they have one thing on their mind. And you'll see them cruising around at 30 miles an hour, <laughs> flying all over the place, splashing around in two feet of water while they're actively spawning. And those fish that are actively spawning, it's not worth your time. But the great thing about the way fish spawn is not all, all the fish spawn at once. So there are going to be active fish. You just need to work a little bit, weed through them uh, to find those few that are not that are either still pre-spawn or they pre-spawn and they're trying to now, get their energy. Do you find that a situation like that, are there areas where you'll find more spawning fish versus pre- or post-spawn fish? Like will they sort of trail off into deeper water or? Where yeah, so your spawning fish are going to be right up in the shallows, in amongst the reeds. Like I'm talking if, if Think of the thickest reeds you've ever seen, and you will not believe that these 10, 15, 30 pound fish can actually get back in these reeds. Um, and you'll see them splashing around. You'll hear it. It's a commotion. It sounds like, like, like you know, there's like a bullfight going on back in the reeds or something. And that's where they're usually do, having, uh, commencing with their spawn. Um, they will, you'll see them, uh, and this goes to say with any carp, when you see them cruising like really quick, those fish have had something on their mind and it's not feeding. Uh, they're going from point A to B, or they're in the active mode of chasing a, a female to spawn, whatever it is, um, to moving fish that are that are going quick. They're just not worth targeting in general. Um, but yeah, so looking for spawning fish, they're right in the backs of the bays, uh, right up in the, in, almost on shore. I've seen them in uh, an area in Toronto, like Tommy Thompson Park, where they're up on the rocks almost, like their backs are fully out of the water in mid-spawn. Um, it's, it's absolutely wild to, to see them, like a 30 pound fish, half of its body out of the water. Um, but yeah, they won't eat anyways. Um, but yeah, what you wanna look for um, are those pre or post-spawn. Um, post-spawn in general is early June till, you know, till the end of the season. Um, but the first couple of weeks of post-spawn, early June into July uh, is, is great. Um, you wanna look for fish that uh, like I said, don't target the ones that are moving really quickly. You want to target ones that are uh, singles, even groups. Um, I, I do prefer to target single fish because if you spook it, you're not spooking a whole group of fish, um, and you will spook probably 50% of these fish. It's a which are present fact as well with, uh, with carp is they actually have a, a pheromone that will release when, when one group member is spooked, alerting the others. So it's not just them swimming off quickly, it's, it's yeah. that, and that'll kind of kill an area for a while too, right? Yeah, really. And it, it takes a while for them to chill back out. So when you do spook fish, uh, you can just stand there for 15, 20 minutes. Try not to move much. Don't just be false casting. Stand there with, you know, 10, 15 feet of line at your feet, fly in your hand, um, and wait. And oftentimes they'll come back um, and resume feeding. And, and when they're feeding, uh, it can be super obvious, but it can also be, it can also be surprising to you. Um, 
they can be an active feeder where they're going along the bottom, sucking up in the bottom. You'll see big dust clouds. You'll see uh, floating weeds where they've dislodged from the bottom. One thing I always look for at a distance, you know, in the, in the salt water, you're looking for birds that at a distance with carp, if you look for bubbles coming to the surface. Uh, oftentimes they're in the bottom and eating, pulling up damsel and dragonfly nymphs. And that's releasing like methane gas that's trapped underneath the bottom. And those bubbles, specifically if they're coming from the airport pretty intensely, that's a feeding carp. Yeah. Um, and you work your way towards it. Um, so those are obvious fish. You see them, you know, in a two feet, a foot of water and they're, their nose at the bottom, sucking up, spitting out. And moving slowly, vacuuming the bottom, and oftentimes in singles or in big groups. Um, but one that I prefer to target is those loner fish that are just sitting still. Um, they're all, they're like a lion weight predator in that sense. They will wait for an insect or a bait fish or a great fish to present to them. Uh, these fish get huge by not burning a lot of energy. Uh, they eat a lot and they sit around. Um, so... When they're sitting there, you know, they might be belly to bottom, maybe slightly suspended four or five inches off the bottom. If you can get in nice and close and present a very slow sinking fly right to the left or the right, or get in right up on top of them and drop a fly just above their head, um, you will be amazed at how often these fish feed. That's uh, one of my biggest tips is if you can find a loader that's sitting still, you got a pretty good shot at catching that one. Um, and, and yeah, like trying, the schools are great, but like you said, if you, if you, Slide your feet a little awkwardly, make a bit noise. You spook that whole group, and it could be, but you could be shot. So, um, if you can walk slowly, uh, I always talk about before you take, you know, your next two steps. Make sure there's no carp around. You know, look around, left and right. Do your best to really take your time. There's no rush because um, it'll, it, you know, it'll be worth it once you get on top of one and you've gotten in nice and close. Yeah, I had a question from uh, just backtrack a little bit from Catherine. Uh, did the fish that are not spawning place themselves with the spawning ones or further back? So I guess she's asking about you know I think the steelhead you've got you know spawning fish and you'll usually have a few males or whatever back of them. You know are, are the yeah. are the not yet spawning fish not kind of pushing up into that shallow area too? I think it's a yes and a no. Oftentimes you'll see them in there because where they're spawning is a great feeding water too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that shallow muddy bottom um soft bottom is, is is very popular with these fish like they like i said they suck off the bottom they're feeding on insects by filter feeding they suck up a cloud of mud and they filter it through their gills you'll see the, the mud come out their gills and then they're trapping um whatever insects or or uh, edible material that they find um so they do often intermix with the spawning fish um but also on the other side of things when these spawning fish are right up oftentimes the fish that are post-spawn are just outside of them and they're slowly cruising, um, cruising the flat and again, feeding. Um, the, without seeing them, it's really, uh, you just have to see it. Like a spot, the spawning carp are so obvious. That's what they're doing. You will see hundreds of them in, in these little bays just splashing around like crazy. And uh, it's, it's, it's not really worth targeting them, but if you can find those fish that are just a little bit more chill, uh, they look more comfortable. They're not in a rush. Um, they're just hanging out. Those are the ones you want to target. And they will be friends right in with them, oftentimes, though, just outside. Yeah, I think uh, it's important to remember, too, like you said, like not all fish, even of the same species with the same sort of spawning range, are going to do it at the same time. Like you look at steelhead, yeah. we've got, you know, fish that spawn as early as, you know, February, potentially, or maybe even earlier, you know, all the way out until June on the late end. So they sort of diversify their spawn times, you know, it, in order to survive partially, then it's just a natural effect, right? Definitely. And I wouldn't say it's as broad as that with carp. I would say it's a couple weeks difference with the fish throughout the range. But yeah, definitely. There's not the entire you know, population is not going to be spawning at once. Um, oftentimes you'll find, uh, you know, the, the smaller fish are up there first. Um, they're, the males are getting really aggressive. They're in there getting in the mood. Um, and then you'll find the bigger female that cruising a little bit of the, the next kind of uh, contour line, so to speak, you know, like from six inches down to maybe two feet, they'll be out there. And then once, those fish are up there. Oftentimes the smaller ones have already pushed back out. They've done their spawn. So just keep your eyes out. The biggest thing is don't go after the active splashers. Um, you're just not going to, it's, it's fun to chase fish and see them. Don't get me wrong. But if you are wanting to do your best or have your opportunity to fish, fish those ones that are being slow. Uh, they just look comfortable. That's the best way to describe it. They're just sitting there in the weeds. They're up in the sun. Um, they're enjoying, you know, sitting there. Awesome. Cool. Hey, Kevin, um, uh, before you start on the next point, uh, one other question from Mike. Um, do you fish rivers for carp as well, and how different is that when you do? 
Yeah, rivers are great. Like all, one very popular river that has a huge carp population uh, in Ontario is the Grand River. Um, all the way from from the top of that Bellwood Lake Dam uh, down, you can find them. Um, I do prefer uh, still water. Um, I find I, I find larger fish. Um, in, you know, I fish Georgian Bay a lot. Uh, it's close to me. That's my my backyard almost. Um, the crystal clear water of Georgian Bay is a huge asset to finding these fish. But if I was fishing a river, there's a few different things that I look for. I've done quite well in the Grand. Usually, when you know trout fishing slowed down. Um, is fishing like those really slow back corners, eddies, almost water, um, finding those areas that have next to no movement. Maybe they're by an island or uh, a bend in the river. Um, an area where you really wouldn't you know, fish for trout. It just kind of looks bassy almost. Yeah, you know, foggy, kind of stagnant. Yeah. Um, you'll, in the grand, you'll see them cruising. They'll be in those little back eddies swimming around in circles. And they're feeding. They're usually picking stuff out of the current. Another area that I target heavily is foam lines. Uh, but they like to have protection from above. Mm -hmm. I this specifically on bright days. Excuse me. Uh, so if you can find a foam line and you can, uh, you'll usually find them tucked right underneath them. And again, it's just really important that you get an area with low current because you often need to present these flies to them for a few seconds and just something that's whipping by them. They don't really have uh, a fair opportunity to move over and suck it up. Right. Uh, it is possible for sure. Especially when you get into the lower ground, uh, there's so many carp around. Uh, I've had some great days down and around that area where, you know, you're fishing in the heavy weeds, it's low current. Um, and the great thing about the Grand, too, just like Georgian Bay, you never know what you'll catch the next fish. So yep. it's pretty cool. It's a great point. Awesome. Uh, any other questions? Uh, not at the moment. I'll keep calling them out as they come. Cool. We're going we're to get the time. Just worry. I'm just going to go over a few more things, you guys, and everybody on the call. Um, if you're needed uh, to target these fish, um, I would say the most, the best all around rod for fishing either of those types of structure I talked about shallow, rocky flats to weedy flats and weedy bays would be like a nine foot eight weight either fast action or moderate fast action. Um, fast action, they're both rods that most people that have targeted saltwater would have already, which is great. So this gear that you think you're not gonna use because of the, the travel restrictions and all that, you can use them. Uh, they, they will, they're perfect for carp. Um, I personally like a moderate fast. Oftentimes I do fish a little lighter tippet than I would in saltwater. Um, I like to go down sometimes that, you know, usually I fish 12, sometimes 10. Uh, in crystal clear situations, I have fished eight when there's, and let me emphasize emphasize, eh, emphasize that um, when I go down to eight, it is really an area where I, I don't have heavy cover to contend with. Um, right. That's a big thing. And smaller fish. Uh, I, I, you know, if you're targeting 30 pound fish, it's really not ethical to be throwing eight pound at them. Um, but, uh, you know, 10 or 12, when sometimes bonefish, you know, I fish 15, 12, maybe like 12 left for me down there, I find. Um, so a little bit lighter, uh, moderate fast will give you a little bit more, um, shock absorption from their runs because they will be sitting still and all of a sudden they'll blister off 50 yards of line in a run. Um, so you want to have a little bit of shock absorption, but if you have an eight weight fast, uh, it's going to be a great rod. Uh, something with a fighting butt on the rod is super important. Uh, the way I fight them is super low angle, not nice to them. Um, with the exception of when I'm in nice and tight to the fish and there's a lot of structure in front of me, I'll often lift up really high until they run out to the open water. And then I'll low angle, I'll work my lefts and rights. Um, and I just put, just dip that butt of the rod right into your stomach, into your chest. Um, hold the cork, don't hold the rod blank. I've seen multiple people blow up their rod on these fish. <laughs> Pulling just a little bit and that fish decides to just take a big run and the rod snap. They're made to bend the cork. They're not made to bend to wherever you decide to place your hand. So make sure you don't touch the, the blank while you're fighting the fish. Um, and then uh, when I get them in close, um, these fish are pretty much impossible to hand land uh, in like in water that's waist deep. They have nothing to hang on to. <laughs> their tails have no wrist. Their tail holds completely like streamlined, so it's really hard to get them. Um, I do with a like a steelhead size wading steelhead size wading net, uh, something with a short handle, easy to maneuver while I'm in the heavy cover, um, and it's good because you can then just keep the fish in the water as well while you're unhooking. Um, if you did have to hand legs, you didn't have a net, I'd recommend trying to get them to as shallow water as possible. Um, and it's often like a scoop. You kind of go around their belly and underneath their pectoral fins and you can kind of lift them up from that area. But they have to be extremely tired because 
you know, you're wrestling a potentially 30 pound fish. It's really tricky. Um, like I said, they're quite smooth <laughs> all the way around. They look like they should be tough. Um, I, I avoid, I know some guys will say just, you know, gill grab them. They don't have much of a gill to hold on to. I prefer not to. Um, it's one thing if you've got to use it to help open up their mouth to get a hook out, but I don't recommend gill gilling them to land them. So try to get them in shallow water. Once they're on their side, they're a little bit, uh, easier to land um however uh net is a great op- great option like i recommend a net for every species um as i'm sure you guys do too uh it's so much better for the fish you land the, you land way more fish because you're not messing around missing the attempts at uh, landing them um and then one other thing uh so or to guess two more the, the leader um i really like to use uh like a nine foot to 12 foot saltwater taper uh like you know, permit bonefish leader. Yeah, exactly. Um, something that goes down to 15, 16 pound, uh, and then I run a 10 or 12 pound tip it off of that. Knotless leaders are really, um, specifically in the heavy cover because it's with, when you put knots in your leader, um, they're just going to catch every weed possible on a fish runs and you are going to break up fish because of those knots. Um, they are not afraid. Like you'll see them when they're up in the really heavy, thick reeds. Uh, they are not afraid to get into the heavy stuff. So, the less knots, the better. Um, and, uh, and when I'm fishing, um, in the open water, I, you can get away with a six or a seven weight. It does work. Um, you know, you just, these fish are going to run regardless if you have an eight or a six weight, they're going to peel line. Um, but an eight weight does give you that ability to cast into the wind a little bit more. Um, cause let's face it on Georgian Bay, it's often windy. You might get a couple hours in the morning with no wind. Uh, and in the evening with no wind, but throughout the prime time, which is, Opposite of most species, when it's right from like 10 a.m. till 5 p.m., nice and bright out, um, you're going to have a little bit of wind to contend with. Uh, and then, alternatively, when I go into the really heavy cover, uh, if you check out my Instagram page, some photos from a uh, uh, salmographer or uh, Gab uh, that he's posted where I'm right up in these reeds and, and you can hardly see me in them. Like we're, we're pushing them away as you're walking through them. Um, I use a 10 weight cover, so really, really heavy. Uh, something I would use for pike or musky. Um, and then I just use for that leader, it's when I call it a draw, um, uh, my reach and drop technique. Uh, it's a long, straight piece of 15 pound tippet. It's, it's nothing fancy. I want to be able to reach out as far as I can and just drop that fly in those little pockets in those reeds. Uh, and that's also the only time I trout set. <laughs> <laughs> when it's in that cover, lift up and then let them run. Uh, every other time you're targeting them, when it's on a weedy flat or uh, or um, a rocky bottom, strip set is your friend. Uh, it's going to be like you're slowly stripping. You're going to feel weight and just give it a nice long strip. It doesn't have to be aggressive because oftentimes they'll pick it up and spit it out before you can react. And if you were to lift up that every time, you're going to miss a lot of fish. If you give them a strip and you feel weight, give it another little, little extra pull uh, and that will help set the hook. You'll know when you hook them, they're going to take off. Um, the biggest thing you can see, uh, or biggest thing I recommend when you think you've had one bite, because you won't feel it often, uh, these fish like and suck things off the bottom, is you're going to see them close to your fly, uh, and then you're going to see that mouth just kind of go whoop, and that's about it. You're going to see a little, it almost goes white, and the inside of their mouth is, is a very light colored tan, uh, much lighter than the rest of their body, and it just sticks out and comes back in. And at that point, just give it like a six inch strip set, see what happens. If it didn't eat, well, you might have just brought its attention over even more to eat it again. Uh, just keep doing that until you feel the weight and then give it a good, you know, one or two foot strip set. Um, and then make sure you have good line management. Um, you know, I often use a stripping basket when I'm in the heavy cover. Uh, when I'm in the open water, still use a stripping basket because the wind can take your line away from you. Um, and it might get wrapped around your leg and your feet. Yeah. And if you use a stripping basket or uh, or if you're just cognizant of where you place your line, uh, doing many loops as you're doing, as you're stripping in, keeping the line in your hand. It's going to serve you uh, dividends because those fish are going to take take all of your line on their first run for sure. Um, One other quick question from uh, Catherine again. Um, wanted uh, to know uh, if you could explain how to hold the fish while taking photos. Um, yeah. Like once you have it under control, it's basically just like cradle lift, right? Yeah. So unlike trail, you might be tailing it around the wrist. I often get underneath the pectoral fins with my hand and have the one pectoral fin on the side furthest away from my body in between my index finger and my middle finger. Uh, and then my thumb cradled around the body and then my back hand just underneath the, uh, the vent vent fin in that area, just to support their weight because they are just so heavy. And if you were to try to hold them with one hand, it's really tricky. 
Uh, that's the best way for photos. Uh, if you want, you know, um, a grip and grin for sure, that's a good way to do it. Um, these are sensitive fish though still, but they are burly, they are tough. They kind of can live through a lot of different water temperatures and, and, and water, you know, turbidity than a lot of other fish can handle. But still like you do want to take care of them. Uh, they're, they're big, they're old. A lot of these cars can get quite old. Um, you know, into the 30 and 40 years if they've recorded them. So quite a bit older than a lot of other species we target. They deserve our respect. So I do try to keep them in the net as long as possible or in the water. And a quick lift. Um, I'm a fan of a little bit more, uh, you know, photos in the water. It's always cool. Uh, a little bit different perspective too. So once you've got them chilled out, you can hold them by the tail, by like the wrist. Um, it's just not almost impossible to land them like that. If you're just trying to navigate them in the water, you can totally do that. Um, and try not to like bear hug me. Uh, you're just going to take a lot of the protective slime off them uh, and you can get, you know, infection and all that from there. Cool. Um, where was I? Was there any other questions there, Chris? Not at the moment. Yep. Cool. Um, so we talked about that. I want to dive into that reach and drop technique a little bit more because it's my most effective. Uh, we talked about weighting the flats, you know, uh, in the rocks, you often want to fish patterns that are like crayfish or gobies in the weeds, death in the dragons are my two favorite patterns to fish. Um, the reach and drop tech really involves stealth. Like you're going to walk slowly. You're going to pick that fish out from hopefully 30, 40, 50 feet away. And you're going to work your way into 10, 12 feet away from it. Um, and you're literally, or you're, lift, you're just going to extend your front arm as far as you can, pull it enough line. And you're really going to place fly like to the left or the right of the fish. It's not a, not a cast. It's definitely not fancy, um, but it's effective because, like I said, these fish are so spooky. Uh, oftentimes, um, casting if you tried to cast to a, a fish on the flat and you try to hit it, uh, you're going to spook it. Uh, the best advice I have is cast in front and beyond uh, and move your fly into their feeding lane. Um, there's a, a technique where people will cast. And then once the fly hits the water, they'll lift and they'll almost like you're um, adjusting your drift with a dry fly. Um, you'll lift your rod tip and you'll skate that fly towards the fish. Once the fly's in the water and there's not a big splash, um, they don't really spook from the fly just skipping across the surface. It's interesting. I guess maybe like insects and stuff do that and they're used to it, but there's no sudden splash. Um, so you really want to, regardless of how and where you're targeting, just present a gentle presentation. Um, you're going to get their attention on the drop. Keep that in mind. Um, oftentimes, you're, you you want to cast and pull your fly into them, and put it on them while they're you know you don't want it to drop ten feet in front of them and wait for them to come open and then wiggle it. You can catch fish doing that, but a lot of the time it's on the drop. So it's going to come down. You're going to see them pivot towards it. I feel like you're like, getting more times than not, but you'll see them move. Yeah, I feel like a, like a, a crayfish or something like that. Like they dive to get away from predators. You know, it, yes. it makes sense to think that if crayfish saw a big carp coming, it's diving down to the bottom to get away, similar to a shrimp or something on the flats, too, right? Yeah, got it. Um, yeah, so that's a general presentation. They're going to be interested at it on the drop. There's no scent involved, like traditional carp techniques, where they're rummaging a bottom full of chum. I mean, people are using corn, boilies, stuff like that. Um, with this, there's no scent involved. These are just flies that look like the stuff that they want to eat. And they have an incredible sense of smell, so we're even trying to trick them that. They don't have any scent. Um, not that I haven't heard of people putting scent on their flies, but you know, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, Marty was asking uh, if you had any suggestions for fly lines. I know we were going to cover that. So I don't know if you want to touch on that now. Yeah. yeah. So the, the line is, you know, uh, just as important as the rod and the wheel um, in carp fishing is sometimes line is more important than times. I think I've been in the shop with you guys and people ask what they should spend more money on the rod or the reel, and you're like, spend more money on your line. Uh, it makes a huge difference in your presentation. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, a lot of cool water water lines. I use uh, like a real redfish uh, taper. I think I got one there. Yeah, Awesome line. It's got a lot of power. So when you lift up and cast, it's one false cast usually. Like you're not making with foot casts often. These are 20 foot casts, 30 foot casts on the average. Uh, you can pick up have the head out of the rod tip and lay it down again. Uh, they, they handle well in that water temperature, like 60s and 70s. Um, unlike a tropical bonefish line, which is definitely handles better, less memory, and like 80 degrees plus, uh, you know, high 70s, 80s. If somebody was wanting to use their bonefish gear and they were fishing like midsummer, they could potentially use that depending yeah. on temperature, like you say. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Uh, on the thing is, like, you know, the average temperature in Georgian Bay is very, very cold. That's like, true. out in Georgian yeah. Bay in the middle of summer, it still could be in the 
you know, high 50s and 60s. Yeah. Um, but in these weedy back days, I mean, we've taken temperature readings in the 80s. Uh, like, it's bath water. Uh, but these carp are in there still feeding quite aggressively. Yeah. And they do breed a little bit slower in the fast, in the high temperatures, though. So they're, they're like, they are very much more comfortable in a cooler water. So that 60 degree range is like, um, so yeah, redfish taper is something I love. Um, if you've, you know, that's probably your best all around line. You can also use, if you're using bigger flies, so I'm not going to talk about them today, but sometimes I'll use like two and three inch goby patterns, um, larger crayfish patterns. Uh, and you can throw like a small mouth line. That's a really good option. Something that's got a lot of weight forward. Again, floating is these species you don't need anything that's a tip or intermediate nothing like that needed we're fishing shallow water, less than three feet you want to be able to get your fly down quick um sure or live in deeper water but they're just not really accessible as easily on fly um, most of my fish come out of a foot and a half to three feet of water um and then uh and for like yeah. more spooky fish like river fish stuff like that would you recommend something a little more delicate <laughs> Yeah, like a, like a trope fly, wait for a trope line, like a streamer line or something like that, something standard all the way around. Awesome. Um, that could be, you know, something that you could use for a trout when you're on the grand and you're throwing your five weight and then you see some carp and you're going to trout her off. Well, yeah. put on a carp fly. If you really you want hand. to get like dialed in with that, like trout lines, uh, in case anyone doesn't know, generally their comfortable range sort of maxes at around 70 degrees or so because we're not fishing for trout in water that warm. So as I say, if you're in the 60s, your trout line should work fine. But if you're in warmer environments, maybe bonefish line, you know, like a true bonefish does have a longer head like a trout line and, and they work for that kind of thing too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Great questions. Those are awesome. Cool. Very nice. We're good for now. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, so I think right now I'll whip up one pattern to start, if that's good with everybody. Let's do it. Let's fire here. So, all right. So... We're going to start with one. I got one pre-tied here. Um, this is probably my best all-around pattern. Excuse me while I try to reach around a camera and tie. It's pretty tricky. I didn't realize how hard it was. Um, get some light on that for you. Uh, this is a fly pattern um, called the carp dragon. Um, it's probably my most effective pattern I find in all types of water. Um, we'll tie it up, but I'll just talk about it a little bit first. Um, some keys to a a good cart pattern is make it buggy. Uh, it doesn't need to be perfectly tied. You don't have to have, you know, everything placed perfect. Um, oftentimes, well, with a lot of fish, the more the fly, more fish the flies caught, oftentimes they can work better. Um, so something that's a little bit buggy, uh, using lots of marabou, ice dubbing, uh, hen saddles, uh, rubber legs are really popular in almost all cart flies. They do have just that little bit extra movement. These are centipede legs. And then one thing a lot of people don't think of, is tying your flies in multiple different weights with different styles of eyes. So something like this has, um, has a, like a dumbbell eye. It's very small. I think it's an extra small size. Um, but that will still sink really, really quick because that fly is pretty streamlined. It doesn't have a lot of resistance besides the rubber legs in the water. Um, so I would fish this fly in you know that two to four feet of water uh, would be ideal. It's tied uh, anywhere from a size 10 to like a maybe a six on the big side if you were trying to imitate you know because it's black it's just a silhouette it could imitate anything really which is great a lot of these flies are um, made to represent many food items they're not represent one um so yeah uh this car called the carp dragon originally is designed to imitate a dragonfly uh, tied in black um again just high contrast um in those environments i think contrast is key a lot of times you're fishing above these fish and they're looking against a blue or a white background on the surface so having something that stands out to them um dark patterns are by far the most popular i think when carp fishing first started a lot of people uh thought they needed you know they would just use bonefish flies and you're like yeah sure uh, did that work it, you can catch fish on a bonefish fly um but carp patterns tend to be a little bit darker so i'm going to start off here with, uh, I'll tie it with a real little bit larger hooks. Well, not larger, but on the bigger side today. Um, one of my favorite hooks for, for carp, um, the uh, H970BL. It's a heavy wire hook from Hannock. Um, I do like barbless um, from all fish, but specifically for carp too, because their mouths are like so rubbery that a barbed hook is sometimes hard to remove. They, uh, it's really hard to get pressure on that hook to remove it. Um, okay, so I like that hook. It's a heavy wire. Um, which is key because these fish are big. They're going to pull hard. Um, hopefully I can get this in somewhat focus. Keeps going in and out, which is annoying. Maybe once I start tying, yeah, it'll... Once you start getting some materials on there, it should probably come in. We'll see. Um, I'm using a black Vivas 6-aught thread. 
Um, good all around thread. Beavis is really hard to break, which is nice when you're cinching down these materials. Um, I'm not sure why. I mean, with Vivas, they're not really flat, right, Chris? They're like braided or well, the, rolled. Yeah, the six aught tends to be pretty round. The eight aught, yeah. ten aught, they start that way, but you can flatten them if you want. Um, yeah. yeah. This but thread is really aught. tough. It's, yeah. it's, it's a perfect thread for, the, uh, for these types of patterns. I use it for bigger trout patterns, bass patterns as well. Um, but uh, for carp, I do like the six aught black. Um, so let me just get that in there a little bit more. <laughs> All right, so you start your thread, work it all the way back down, just past the point of the hook. Like I've had these, I use the whole shank on carp flies. Um, unlike trope flies where oftentimes you'll start, stop at the barb or the point, like I work back. I'm trying to get a larger presentation, biggest presentation as possible on a smaller hook. Um, this one's a size eight, so along the larger size that I would fish for carp. Um, there are predatory carp out there that will feed on large patterns. Like I'm not saying you can't fish two and three inch patterns, but today I'm going to focus on the most effective patterns for carp. And these will fish anywhere and everywhere from your small little, you know, park ponds that have carp to the Great Lakes. Um, the first bit of material for the carp dragon uh, is often people use Arctic Fox um, for the tail. Um, I do like Marabou. Um, I find it ties in a little bit nicer. It moves really well. Arctic Fox moves well in the water, but at a shorter distance, because this tail is only going to be like a quarter inch, maybe a half inch long at most. Um, you want it to have as much movement as possible. And Arctic Fox can be a little bit stiff at shorter lengths. So I like marabou. So trim your marrow, pull back all the fibers you don't need. Make sure you pull it to your tips or level. Uh, you're going to tie that in with just a loop, maybe two loops. And then you're just going to pull it to, to get where you want. So we're just past the bend of the hook. This is pretty key for these patterns because you, the fish are going to suck it in and spit it out so fast. If you have a really long tail and they're not really predatory fish, they're not, you're going to miss a lot of fish. So you really want to um, keep that close to the back of the hook as close as possible anyways. And that was a size 8, was it, Matt? I, size 8. Yeah, I saw that label right. I think that particular yeah, hook, right the 970, I think, is, I think 8 is the biggest, right? It is. So um, somebody wants six. to go up six. to a six? I have a six as well. Um, oh, it does. Okay. I'm mistaken. That's six be as big as I do, but I do, like, my most common patterns I tie are on tens and eights for cart, for sure. Um, it's actually an awesome trout streamer hook, too. I love that one. It's super sharp. All the panic hooks are great. Um, the points don't roll as easily, I find, as on some of the Euro hooks, where they get a little soft and... Well, it's one thing I learned the hard way the first few years I was chasing carp um, is always check your hook point. <laughs> yeah. If you lot miss the fish, you're like I swear he ate it or they ate it, um, check the hook point yeah. because often it's rolled uh, and you can file them out, you know, or you can just buy a hook that holds a point a little longer. All right. So we've tied in that marabou now, nice and short. Um, at this point, oh, sorry. I'm going to, at this point, I'm going to tie in the, uh, the lead eyes or the dumbbell eyes, whatever you choose. Um, I recommend uh, extra small to small would be about the biggest I would fish in a dumbbell eye. Um, and then I fish a lot of bead chain as well. So the dumbbell eyes, we're going to fish them or tie them pretty close to the eye of the hook. We want them uh, right in there with a couple wraps just to secure it. And then we're going to rotate it by pulling the thread over the back. And we're going to figure eight wrap a few times. Then one thing I always do is I go around the base of the eyes a couple times and then pull it tight. And that really helps seat that on there and it doesn't want to rotate on you, which is nice. Um, oftentimes, a lot of people will throw in a bit of Zappa Gap or glue of some sort on here to hold them in place. Uh, one tip I haven't talked about now is I don't use glue on my carp. Um, I find they're like, I, I've caught fish on flies with head cement, but I think I catch more without. I don't yeah. know if it's that super sensitive glue they have. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I usually just do no glue and a few whip finishes instead of one i'll do like two or three yeah. um and they, they, the flies tend to stand up oftentimes you can you, as long as you don't break off the fly you're going to catch multiple fish on one fly so yeah more honest, you ask I, I rarely even use glue on trout flies yeah same reason yeah i don't know if it's just a paranoid thing or if it is <laughs> there's something to it but <laughs> it makes all the best as possible right um, um, one other comment uh i noticed you tie in the marabou before the eyes. Do you find that the eyes mount a little better once there's a material on there? Yeah, I don't think it's anything with that, really. Maybe it does. Um, I think you could do it either way. Um, I usually... Uh, why do I do that? It's just the way I've always... 
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could, you could do it. I like trimming my marabou flat because I want to tie the, the base material, like the first material you tie the hook, similar to like traditional salmon flies. Like you want to tie the whole length of your shank to make sure you get a good taper to your fly. Sure. Um, uh, so if I did that, I think if I tied the eyes in first, I'd have this like, when I'm trying to snip that, it'd be really tough to get close to the yep. shank. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, so that's probably why I do it. Um, but yeah, good question. I'll have to try it either way. Um, you guys just put an awesome video on dubbing. Um, so, you know, making sure you twist it one direction. Don't, don't spin the material. Like don't, you know, make sure you're twisting it onto the thread. Uh, don't just twist it with your hand, right? Spin it. Um, so one thing I always use is a little bit of dubbing wax real quick, just to help stick. Cause we're going to use ice dub, which can be a little bit tricky to dub. It's a synthetic dubbing. It tends to, a lot of people when they're first using it, they're used to using rabbit or, uh, anything like that. Um, and it, it really goes on easy. Ice dubbing is a little bit trickier. So ice, uh, sorry. So, um, that's ice dubbing, um, black, it's synthetic. It's got UV flash in it. I think UV does help stand out a little bit more to the fish, help sketch their eye. Um, it could also represent, you know, the many little bubbles that are stuck to a nymph. Um, cause it does give that little bit of glare. Uh, but yeah, so ice dubbing, um, dubbing, you want to use just a little bit. You don't want to use a lot. Uh, and you can always add more. Um, if you add too much to your fishes, it's going to be tough to get a nice taper to your fly. So, Starting off with a little bit, I've added, um, I've added the wax already, so it's nice and sticky. And notice that I'm actually spinning it through my fingers, not twisting it, like you said in your video, right, Chris? <laughs> awesome video, by the way. Thank you. So you're gonna start doing that, and oftentimes I'll slide it up a little closer to the hook once I put in a couple. It's a pretty thin noodle; like it doesn't need to be. A big wad of dubbing on your hook. Like I said, you can always add more. Yeah. Now, uh, a lot of trout dragonflies you'll see are often super big and bulky. Um, but again, this is called the carp dragon. It's pretty slim. It's designed to be, you know, mistaken as many food items. So it's not specifically a, a dragonfly nymph because carp will feed on many species of insects or leeches or anything that's available to them. Um, unlike Trout will do that as well, but oftentimes if they're keyed onto a dragonfly hatch and spill water, it's, they got to be really, you know, they got to be bulky because that's what a normal dragonfly is. So I've tied that in just behind the eyes. You can see it kind of just behind it left a little bit of room because we're going to add just a couple other materials here. Mm -hmm. um, next one is going to prep it here a little bit. It's a nice brown, like soft hackle, something like a hen hackle. Um, we're going to tie that in just behind the eyes. Just a few wraps, pull tight. Don't need to go overkill. And I always snip that off right now. Okay, there's my half pliers. There we go. All right, and then we're just going to take a couple turns. It doesn't need a lot of material. These are just to represent legs or a little bit extra movement on the fly. Before I wrap in a soft tackle, I usually stroke the fibers back and down a little bit, which helps them lay properly while wrapping. And you will break a few tackles. I'm surprised I haven't broke this one. There we go. And don't be upset with yourself and break them. They're pretty fine stems at times. Once you tie in, lay it down, just give it a wrap to secure it. Nice pull so it's locked. And then like two more. So you say that black is your favorite color in this one. Do you tie it in anything else? I tie it in olive as well. Yep. I would say there's three colors in my fly box majority. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest thing I recommend with carp is teachers or um, presentations like only have a few patterns. You don't need a lot. Uh, and it gives you less reason to change flies and just <laughs> more focus on the presentation. So I think that's one thing I need to learn trout fishing this year, you know, <laughs> limit how many flies I bring on the river with me. Yeah. Um, it does make a big difference. Like it's usually your presentation. It's not usually to do with the fly pattern itself. So black and olive. And then I usually fish some sort of crayfish pattern, like a little bit of orange in it, the tan, um, so those are kind of the three colors. So I'm, I'm going to reverse that in my vise just so now it's in like, like a, I guess you would say like a clouser kind of position, hook point up, dumbbell eyes down. And I'm going to tie in the rubber for the legs. So that's you guys here. Uh, lots of barring on them. Um, you're going to place them just behind the eye. Give it a wrap to see how it sits. Okay, that's pretty good. And then I'm going to take another one. 
And and important to note, you're kind of tying these above the eyes, not behind them. Yes. Because behind them flare yeah. straight out, right? Right. Yes. Um, they're, they're like, uh, it's hard to see on the camera. I don't know if I can bring it. Yeah, well, yeah, I can't I go with the closer. Pass, yeah. But it, it goes on top of the hook shank um, above the dumbbell. Because I want this to be, I want there to be a front leg as well, like this one yeah. that's sitting. If I tied them in behind the eyes, they would both be pointing back like that. Sure, it would probably work. I don't know if it would make a difference. But I think when this falls, it falls very horizontally because the legs help give it like almost like a parachute effect. It falls down level. Um, and the littlest twitch with those, these legs just dance. And uh, these fish have really good eyesight. Like when you finally, when you eventually catch a carp and you look at their eyes, they almost look intelligent. <laughs> they got big <laughs> eyes. Um they're big. They they obviously see a lot, similar to like a permit. You know, look at the size of a permit eyes, and you're like, wow. Like no wonder they're they'll freak out over a poorly tied knot or something. Um, carp aren't as particular, but they're pretty dang particular. Um, the front legs, I'll trim them pretty short. Well, shorter than the back leg. I'll make them a size eight, maybe a half inch long, and I'll try to match them. Not that that's super important, but whatever. It's close enough. Maybe a little bit off top there. And then the back legs, I tie them about a quarter inch longer. So that looks to be what probably if you fold it back about as long as the, the bend. Yep. Maybe a tad longer. Just, yeah. Just past, just about like to where the barb would be, like if yeah. there why if there was a barb. Cool. Nice. Before I finish it, I just do a little bit of ice dub again uh, on the head. And again, go light. Oh, I didn't wax this time, but it'll probably go on okay. There we go. Cool. And then uh, wrap. Now, this fly pattern represents about 80% of the techniques that you'll need um, for carp, <laughs> for tying. Like, it's the same materials often. It's tied in a similar technique. Um, so most of my, like, I was going to tie three patterns. I had them all lined up, and I was looking at them last night, and like, they're all variations of like the same pattern. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> they're like rubber legs in different positions or something like that. Yeah. Um, so a couple of whip finishes. Uh, I use my fingers. I forget how to use a tool. Um, <laughs> it's probably no, bad can, of me. But. No, no, that's good. Rob and I are the same, I could say. <laughs> uh, we had one other question. Um, that looked awesome. From uh, Martin. Um on how you picked that uh, that color selection that you like. So did you pick your uh, colors based on insects and bugs you found in the areas where you're fishing, or just by trial and error throwing everything towards them? By listening to the professionals, I think. <laughs> I read a lot, um, following some really, there's some amazing carp anglers on Instagram um, that are, aren't afraid to share their patterns and techniques um, for them. Um, there's, there's surprisingly a lot written about them, even since the 90s. Like, there's been a lot of people fishing for them. Like, even, like, Dave Whitlock used to fish for them quite a bit. Like, pretty big name. And I think he brought, he took the, a lot of the stigma out of, uh, out of carp. Uh, so a lot of those color patterns have just come from other people. Um, but also, when I think about my boxes, even for bass, like, a lot of my patterns are all of black, brown, you know. I think it comes, it does have to do with the watercolor, what insects are present, um, and again, if I tied this in, you know, maybe if I tied that in like a rust in a tan color, it would probably still catch fish, yep. you know? Um, but again, I think I just, it, a lot of this has to come down, has come down to confidence. Um, and uh, yeah, it works for me and it's worked well for me. So I'll keep it, if you did fish it in tan, it would actually be a really great hex pattern. Yeah. And in like the month of June on Georgian Bay, cool. When the hex come off, like your buildings are covered. Uh, <laughs> You, you know, so in the in the evenings, like it might be actually a great pattern if you tied it in tan. Um, but I think also the next pattern I'll talk about when we when I dive talk a little bit talk about the technique a little more and get into tying um, will be uh, a carp bitter and it's tied in like an olive pattern uh, and that represents a hex really well too. So I think yeah. that so, kind of gets at a a good point as well, which is that not everything we need to figure out for ourselves, you know, without any input, like. Ever, there's so many people in all aspects fishing that have put in so many so much work you know you take um you know a guy like gary lafontaine who you know snorkeled yeah. with the caddis to, to figure everything out about them they could you know people have put in the legwork for us there's nothing wrong with taking advantage of existing info and building off that right that's how we advance as a, a community so yeah, yeah and like great. this pattern when it was originally tied was tied with black chenille uh i like ice dub so there's a little yeah, there you go. put on <laughs> nice uh, so it might have 
come from me not having Sunil at a time or something, but like I like Ice Dub bodies. I think they, they give a little bit of flash without it being too over the top. Um, I've seen a lot of patterns and people fish. I, I and Georgia Bay, I see people fishing for the first time and they're using, you know, some patterns that they've used in the salt for permit and stuff. And there might be crystal flash in there, a couple strands and a couple strands is fine. But sometimes you see people showing up with like gotchas and stuff that have just like so much flash on them. And you're like, Ooh, yeah, that's not really going to be, that's not going to work too well. Cause these fish do get scooped easy. So I know a little bit's good, but don't go overkill. Awesome. So that pattern right there, um, many of the friends I've fished with, people I've taken out carp fishing will attest that that pattern is what I fish in the weedy back bays probably 80% of the time. It's super effective, represents many insects and types of forage. So yeah, big, the big key takeaways here, something with a large um, gape on the hook. Um, these fish have big mouths. The bigger your gape of the fly, the more you're going to be able to grab onto that soft mouth. They do have soft mouths, so they can pair out pretty easy. Time something that bites in there a little bit will be good. Barbless be wire like go something like it, it is really overkill for like a nymph when you think about it but it won't bend out on the fish you will because oftentimes you put in the heavy cover i'm fishing straight 15 pound um you will bend out hooks i've yet to bend out one of these i've taken many off though so, yeah any questions about that any other questions about that fly before i move on no i think we're good that's great cool. i really like that thing yeah number one okay Let's see if i can switch this back uh Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, uh, I, was, I briefly touched on um, uh, a technique called like the drag and drop. Um, not dragging, like drag and drop. Um, you're, Chris, you'll attest to when you're saltwater fishing, like you do cast beyond and in front of your fish, your target, right? You're moving, you want to pull that fly towards them. Um, if you did drop any of these flies, even though they're bead chain eyes, you will spook a fish. Well, the drag and drop is super key when you're fishing open water for these fish uh, where there isn't much cover it's a rubble bottom there's maybe a few boulders or they're on a weedy flat where there's you know standing weeds away from them but with the in the middle of the mud um, casting you know 15 feet beyond them and five or ten feet in front of them is really important but don't like you know a lot of these carp moving as fast as a school of bonefish will and they're slowly picking their way so if you waited there they're really going to change directly on you they're not going to just, you might get the odd time where you get looking and you picked it perfect and they move right up to where your fly is. Um, oftentimes you're going to cast. Once that fly hits the water and sinks a couple inches, you're going to just lift your rod tip and you're going to drag that fly towards. You're going to play, the key is placing your fly back on the surface very gently. If you just drop your rod tip, splash of your line is enough to spook them. Keep in mind a lot of these fish are in a foot and a half of water. So they feel those vibrations. And like Chris said, spooks, old school spooks. Um, so drag and drop is super important. Practice it. Um, accuracy is super important with carp. So if you're going to go out for a guided day carp fishing or you're going to uh, go out on your own, uh, one thing you can do is, similar to when you're getting ready for saltwater, set up a couple targets in your local park or your backyard if you've got enough room to cast. Um, one at 30 or 40 feet and one at like 15 or 20 feet. So really close and one a little bit further. And practice picking them up and shooting to each one and adjusting the length of the line that you have out mid-cast. So that's one big tech tip. Yeah. Um, the more accurate your presentation, uh, the more chances you're going to have. They aren't, again, I'll reiterate, they're not stupid. They're, they're, they're pretty tricky to catch. So accuracy is key. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, another question quickly. Um, I guess this would pop up in other patterns too, but uh, super floss versus rubber, which one is better? I'm not familiar with super floss in particular, but I think it's like span flex. Yes, Spanflex is the same yeah. stuff. Um, yeah, those, that's great. Uh, I do like it. I don't have any action on me right now. Uh, I have fished a lot of flies with it. It moves very well in the water. You can even split it so it's like into multiple little fibers. You've gotten it. You tied in. So yeah, good work. Yeah, yeah. nothing. One thing, thing with flies, like uh, nothing's like, locked in. You're you're definitely more experienced with the carp thing than, than me. But um, with trout, I have tested it kind of side by side, at least on stonefly patterns, things like that. Personally, I definitely find rubber legs to be more effective. I think they cause a lot more vibration in the water. I think the cool. super floss kind of, yeah, it gets lost sometimes. But on other patterns like apps, worms, and still water, it's great. So, you know, time and place, give it a go. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, it's your fly, you know. Um, tie a couple of each, see what you, works better for you. Uh, like, again, the most important thing here is getting the fly into their feeding lane, getting it close enough to them for them to see it. I think the pattern is secondary, oftentimes. Yep. Uh, cool. 
Uh, when you are, uh, I want to mention again, uh, strip set when you're fishing, when you're casting at a decent distance. If you're fishing under your rod tip, just dropping flies on them, that's the only time you're going to trout set. You see a lot of people trout setting on them because it's, it's some instinctively you want to do it. Um, when you see a fish, you are probably going to miss them most of the time. And then trying to move a big 20 pound plus fish on a trout set on an eight-weight rod is really hard. You want to strip set you have way more power, you know, straight line to the fish. Um, and you won't miss as many. Um, talk that. Uh, so with open water fish, um, the two most common patterns, I guess you could even say three or two most common things they're eating are crayfish um, and, and gobies. And when I say crayfish, it's juvenile crayfish. Um, it's not three, four inch crayfish. Um, we're not, we're not using large patterns for them. Like you might use for bass. Um, these are pretty small, um, down to size 10, um, in simple patterns to tie. I'll go over one right now. Um, you can also use a goby pattern or a sculpin pattern. It's almost small. Um, I would say if you are going to throw them, uh, I would stay away from like sculpin helmets. Maybe they're a little too loud in the surface. Um, you, there's many carp sculpin patterns out there that really just involve bee chain eyes and a lot of hen hackle, uh, and that can taper really well once it's moving and sinking. Uh, Again, we're shallow water. Um, and uh, one other one, oh, classic, woolly bugger, like awesome pattern for carp in many sizes. Um, you could probably fish a woolly bugger for most of the fish and have an equal shot at just using these patterns as well. Uh, but again, just try to go with brass beads if possible. Tungsten's not really necessary to get down or pretty shallow for most part. Um, and one quick thing that I've heard, um, um, forget his name right now. I should have wrote it down. Um, fishing for carpet, open water. We're using dull patterns on a dull bottom and you can't see your fly, right? You can see your tip of your fly line and you can guess, okay, I'm about 10, 12 feet behind, beyond that fly line, but there might be a lot of fish just sucking up off the bottom and you're just not sure where you've had it here. Um, you can run a tandem fly system and your front wow. fly can be something a little brighter. Yeah. Like, a bob with a squirmy worm off the back. <laughs> it sounds yeah. dirty. They will eat it, yeah. but it acts as cider. And then even oh, okay, I'm about a foot behind that. And then there's my fly, right? So if you tie like on a pretty heavy wire blob hook, I think Dohiku makes a really nice blob hook that I use. Um, be strong, even for like throat. It's really good for carp. Um, I'll tie in a length of squirmy worm, like, I don't know, an inch, inch and a half. And then some really bright cactus chenille, uh, like some orange or some pink, um, and when that sinks, even at 30 feet, you can actually see that fly pretty well. Uh, and if you place that fly and you drag it over top of them and you let it sink, um, you can, ideally, if you can let that pink fly or the brighter fly land on the near side of the fish and your your darker pattern, the one that you're fishing, so to speak, on the far side, well, you got equal shot of the fish grabbing either or, which is really nice. The other option is you know that, okay, that fly is very close to that carp that's actively feeding. Okay. And then any time he opens his mouth, just give it a six inch strip. And that technique really helps people see their flies uh, when they're at any distance. So even at 20 feet, it's not that far, it's double your rod length and you can't see your fly usually. Uh, yeah. They disappear really quick. Uh, so that's, that's a really, that's a really good smart tip. tip. Like, I mean, as you know, Matt, we use that all the time fishing still waters. If you're fishing slow with like, you know, nymphs and things, put a blob above as a cider. Why not? Yeah. And like you could, I, I could see using that for bass and stuff. If you're fishing like you know crayfish patterns and bomb, like sometimes the hits pretty subtle. You could do that. Yeah, it's one that, again. I didn't come up with it. I'm struggling. Unfortunately, I forgot the gentleman's name. That was the. Um, but anyways, uh, it's a really great tip, and it's worked well for me and then for people that are new to carp fishing. And when they are on the rocks, um, it can be challenging to see your fly. But this really helped. And I've caught plenty of fish just on a piece of squirmy worm with a. The cactus chenille, like nothing special. Uh, <laughs> um, just to get back to Mitch quickly, it was asking if you ever just use a piece of cider line for what Matt's describing. You're talking about casting 30 feet or so. You would lose that. You wouldn't be able to see it at that range. Like a blob, it, it's a beacon down there. You'll see it even at 50, 60 feet on a clear day. The uh, the yeah, cider. Yeah. Maybe if you're doing like the drag and drop thing, if you needed a little more confirmation, I guess you could mix it in. But then you have knots and break off points and. Or knots. I mean, every time you tie, even a, you know, a really good knot, oftentimes, like a good knot is like 90% break strength. Yeah. Right? It's losing it's something. As much as possible is it's with these strong fish. Um, yeah. So that's a tip that I only learned in the last couple of years that I use. Uh, 
and it's super effective. So cool. that's a big there. Um, and the biggest thing, uh, react fast. When you see one flare on it, you know, with its mouth, just give it that quick strip right away. Because even bait fishers, you know, I've used, you know, European carp techniques for boilies, and, and it's super fun. And the bite alarms are screaming and all that kind of stuff. But the even with bait, they will pick it up and spit it out so fast that like, you have no chance. All right. So now we've just got some feathers and some synthetic material wrapped to the hook shank. Um, they spit it out even quicker. So just give it that six inch strip set um, and then give it a good one if you feel any resistance at all. Um, that's good. While we're on the topic of open water fish, keep your eyes out for other species while you're out there. Um, it's super fun to bring along a second rod rigged up with something like a four inch minnow pattern, like streamer or something, and throw them at schooling smallmouth or northern, northern pike. Um, in Georgian Bay, Lake Ontario, there's lots of gar pike to catch too, which is super fun. Uh, they're right up in the shallows with the carp. Uh, they'll eat the same flies, which is kind of hilarious. Really hard to hook. Um, uh, some people will use like uh, an entanglement fly. I'm not a huge fan of them because if you break off a fish, like that fish is not likely going to be able to survive. Um, but if you use a sharp hook, weight, like people use, I use a, uh, got like, well, shoot, it's that doesn't matter. Uh, a minnow pattern tied with like, uh, a bait fish pattern tied with like some skip. Yeah. EP yeah. fiber. Oh, fiber. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I will even work. Like it's really durable uh, and their teeth will get tangled in it a little bit, but not to the point that it's wrapping around. The biggest trick is tying on a piece of fluorocarbon, like 30 pound, 20 pound to a small treble hook. Uh, and that will get you a gar. Um, but they're super fun. They jump like crazy. They come out like four feet out of the water. They're not the strongest fish when they're, you know, that 40 inch range because they're pretty skinny, but they're lots of fun. We'll save a day. Um, cool. So I'm going to go into right now my, the, since we're on the open water, we'll talk about um, the hammerhead fly. And this one is a little bit different than the one I'll tie just because I use different eyes. But this is as simple as your crayfish patterns need to be. Um, so some silicone rubber legs, some dubbing loop with some rabbit to your choice of eyes. Um, there is a little bit of crystal flash in there as well, just for a little bit added enticement. This fly, because of the silicone, wants to float and sits up with its claws up in the air like a defending crayfish would. It's small, that's tied on a size 10 stainless saltwater hook that I would use for bonefish. Super strong. Uh, yeah, so Any give me this one. that you're using the stainless hook over the hammock in this case? Yeah, this one, you totally could use the hammock. I think I tied this with an actually caught bonefish on this slide. Yeah. Oh, okay. so, <laughs> you can tie a bunch and like use them for either or. Because uh, it does, it could represent a shrimp really well too in the water, right? Sure. So Nice. Um, yeah, so let's go through this one. It's a little bit of a different technique than the last one. Um, I can find my hook. There it is. Okay. All right, let's pinch that barb. Okay, it's on there pretty good. Uh, I would usually use a thread that matches your body color, but I don't want to change it up right now. I'm just going to stick out with the six aught thread as well. Go to a tan, go to an orange, it would work as well. But um, I'm just going to stick with the black because I have. I'll use dubbing to hide the last portion of the fly anyway, so it's probably going to be completely fine. Save some time instead of me switching out thread. Okay. So, tie that in. Um, I'm going to tie in a few strands of crystal flash. Uh, nothing crazy. Maybe five or six strands of them. Tie them in once, twice, and then give it a good pull. Tie it back again far on the hook shank. This will pattern, because I want the claws to stand up, I do tie a little bit down the bend. It sounds a little silly, silly sorry. Uh, um, but uh, it'll help. The claws Changes position the themselves. Had tilted up. Yeah, not yeah. far because you don't want to impede, you know, the gape of your hook, you know, anything like that. But it'll just help it sit uh, a little bit more into like an attack posture. Trim that, and then this is we're going to trim it pretty short, maybe again quarter inch, just past the bend of the hook. Totally perfect. All right, then we're going to take some silicone legs. Um, I'm a big fan of the, like the the bicolored ones in this sense. Um, this orange portion is actually about an inch longer uh, from the olive portion, uh, but I trim it so that I've only got about a quarter inch of the orange or so. 
ready to go. And I'm going to try to stack these. I mean, case anyone awesome. hasn't seen it, I know you tie an awesome crayfish pattern using those same ones too, right? No, I, think that I was debating tying that before the last one. Yeah. Um, I tweaked it even more this year, and it, it's pretty killer. It works really well. Um, maybe another presentation. <laughs> yeah, it uses maybe. the So, again, with carp flies, a lot of crayfish flies, they let the claws go far back past the hook. I'm going to keep it little bit shorter than normal just to make sure that when they suck it up they actually eat it um give it a couple hard turns right away what i like to do with the silicone is give it a bit of a stretch it helps lower the profile when you're tying it in if you tie it in like that you'll get the bumps in the material you pull it tight and then wrap in you don't have to tie it too tight because you could risk cutting the silicone with your thread so be careful of that there's some loose wraps right to where that crystal flash went in that should give you a nice little splayed kind of crayfish Look, I'm just going to trim those tips there. Cool. That's it. So we're not looking to imitate two specific claws. It's just going to be, you know, uh, something that could represent claws. Yep. Okay. So now we've got the back station all tied in. We can tie in the eyes at this point. Uh, this is BJ and eyes, but instead of just doing uh, two individual eyes, I cut them so there's four eyes, and that helps add a little extra weight, but it also has a little rattle to your fly, a little bit extra sound, I find. A lot of patterns are starting to do this, even you're seeing steelhead flies with the with the double butt bead chain. Uh, like Senio does a lot of his flies with two, I believe, like the and stuff. Um, so it gives a little bit of rattle, a little bit extra weight. Um, so right in at the eye though, we don't need to set this one back too far because this is actually going to be the back station of the fly. And when you pull it through the water, it kind of folds and it almost looks like a crayfish tail, like kind of because they're they're rounded. It looks pretty cool. So I would tie this fly with the the doubled up bead chain, um, and I would tie it in uh, an extra small lead eye, and I would tie it in a single bead chain as well. And then you would have, you know, if you tie up four patterns of each, you'll have op options to throw depending on water depth and what the fish, how spooky they are that day. But you can see there's four eyes. Yeah. Right? A little bit extra rattle noise. They got a really sensitive lateral line, these fish. Uh, you'll notice it when you stub your toe on the small, this little rock and the, the whole school spooks. So <laughs> a little bit of noise isn't a bad thing for them. So dubbing loop, um, we're going to, it's hard to see on camera. It's the way it's set up, but we're going to double up the line. We're going to place it pretty much right on top. Give it three wraps. Now the key with the dubbing loop, you see a lot of people stop at this point. It's to pass your thread around yep. and close off your loop. If you don't close off your loop, the material right up here will just fall out and it's just not going to last. It won't spin properly. Super annoying. So at this point, after that's all tied in, we go right back to the head of the fly. Going to untwist it once because we do close it off. It can twists on you a little bit. All right. Dubbing loop tool in there just to hold it. And then I'm going to take like, um, I have a whole rabbit skin here, but I'm just going to take a, I cut off a strip right here uh, and I'm going to, wax my thread and then place probably a good two inches of rabbit material in here, just the hair. Um, I'm not picking out the guard hairs. I'm not picking out the, the under fur. I want the material as it is. It's going to create a good balance of structure and also flow. Um, that little bit of extra very var variated color as well throughout the guard hair. I don't know if it helps, but it looks good to me. So uh, before you do your dubbing, I want to open it up. Stick your finger in between. Throw a little bit of dubbing wax. You don't need much on this red. And I'm just going to prep a little bit here behind the camera with the rabbit. Was there any other questions or anything right no, now? Not at the moment. If anyone hasn't uh, worked with dubbing loops before, we'd actually just do a video on that as well. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And so I guess with the uh, in terms of the weighting on this one, you say you like to type the double bead chain, the single bead chain, the lead eyes. Um, mm -hmm. Something I guess folks could consider as well is between this and some of the other patterns. This is a pretty scruffy kind of pattern, so it probably sinks a little slower, you know, yeah, even with the same weight. Yep. It just has a lot yep. more drag, right? Yep. Uh, a lot more movement. Um, the reason I do it is. Sometimes in a little bit of a, not an overcast day, um, 
in a day where it might not be completely bluebird air, there are some clouds moving by. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes you really need to slow that presentation down. So tying in a single bead chain um, will give you a good opportunity to you know, let that fly sink super naturally through the water column. Like I said, these fish are going to see it on the drop for the most part. That's when you're going to, that's when they're going to find it. Um, I tie in the, the, the lead eyes or the dumbbells um, when I'm casting to fish that are moving, not super fast, but they are swimming in a direction. And I want that fly to get to the bottom quick and catch their eye. Sometimes a fast moving fly will drive their attention versus a slow. Slow could just look like anything moving through the water. They're not spooky. They're aggressive. Having something that plummets to the bottom, like you said before, uh, when the crayfish spooks or anything like that, a bait fish spooks, it's going to go into the rocks, right? So the minute it shoots down to bottom and hangs out there. Um, so usually on a bluebird day when they're moving a little bit, I'll fish a, a heavier fly. Yeah. But I'll still cast beyond so i'm going to place my material in here the bottom this is a natural rabbit so the base of the of the uh hair is actually like a gray i'm going to place it just to that point and i'm actually going to trim that off i want just the tan material you can't see it now because it's behind the camera I give mad props to anybody that does this on YouTube all the time. <laughs> it's really hard. Okay, so I've got them placed. I'm going to try to even out the tips a little bit without jostling the camera too much. But the most important thing here, I'm just going to trim off the base of this block feathers or feathers hair. I do that by, um, you can see it, my fly pattern back. I push on my thread with my index finger and hold on my dubbing tool. Um, that allows me to apply pressure to the, to the, uh, to the thread and my material won't fall as I trim it. It also gives me a nice platform to just cut right against with my scissors because I can move the thread out of the way and I can trim it up nice and tight in just a couple snips. We'll do it. And even though you want the fly to be like messy, scrubby, um, you want it to be a little clean. So you're going to give your tool a bunch of spins by holding the thread tight, give it a bunch of spins and then let that go and slowly Massage it and it'll spin right out. Oh, of course I forgot a dubbing brush. <laughs> okay, whatever. We'll just use my tips of my scissors right now. Yeah. We'll make okay. it work. This is pretty thin material. It's not like working with like laser dub or something like that. Or actually that worked pretty well. Okay. So you know it's good when you can see your thread through the material. If it's large clumps, um, you actually haven't had it bite down on the on the on the thread enough and it's likely gonna fall out on on a fish or a couple casts this makes for a more durable fly once you get to that point um give it a few more spins just tighten it up and it'll get nice and tight on you at this point you're gonna wrap just like you would palmering a hackle or chenille whatever forward now you don't need to make touching turns um you want this fly to have some bulk but the material is going to provide the bulk not the, like, it, you know, it provides enough structure here for it. Yeah. If you create too tight, it creates too bulky, bulky of a fly. doesn't let it sink fast enough. If there are any bonefish anglers in the crowd, too, this fly kind of reminds me of there's a, an EP fly, mind you, a little more complex, but called um, a, a coyote spawning shrimp. Kind of similar technique. <laughs> that thing is a killer if you want to try it out. Very similar. Yeah. Okay, now I've tied it off, a few wraps, give that a snip. Cool. Pull it back, you can still see that it's pretty sparse through there. You can see light through it, which is key. You don't want it to be too tight. It's still focus for you, it looks like it. Yeah, well, uh, decently well, at least, yeah. Comes and goes. Yeah. <laughs> well, at this point, I usually just use a little bit of dubbing um, just to finish off the flyer in the head. Um, however, you can add in other rubber legs if you wanted. Do a lot of things with it. I'm just going to tie this one simple now with just a little bit extra rabbit dubbing. Uh, same color, just there. We're just going to wrap right up to the bead chain and we're going to call that a fly. Also, works great on smallmouth. So if you see smallmouth out there, don't be afraid to cast it. Don't feel like you have to change up your fly too much. Whoa, broke the thread right there. <laughs> I was waiting for it after he talked up how strong the thread was. And 
Jinxed it. Yeah. Wow. Okay, well, I, let's say I would finish that one. <laughs> <laughs> let's just, oh, let me actually finish it because I do want to finish this fly. Yeah. Shame to waste all that work. No, right? So I'll pull that tight, start over, right on top of it. Not very complex flies, but the right profile, sync rate, and uh, color is key. There we go. Cool. So when it's, well, you can actually see it, it's going to sit with those claws pointing up. See on my hand there, uh, just because the way it's tied in. And they're nice and splayed, just like a, like a crayfish claws would be when it's in a fighting position. Um, and it's got a little rattle. I don't know if you can hear it, but can't really rattle. It. Yeah, can imagine, for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sweet. It's called the hammerhead. I mean, the name kind of makes sense when you look at it like that. Yeah, for sure. It works really well. Awesome pattern. Cool. Um, All right, was there one more in the tank? Hello? Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Was there any other questions or? Nope. Not at the moment. I think you did cool. a great job with that. Awesome. Um, actually, one other fish I didn't talk about while you're out there that you'll notice swimming around mm. is sheephead. And <laughs> they're super fun. Uh, they are so strong. They're our uh, freshwater version of a redfish. Like they're actually, actually related, which is super cool. Um, and do they ever go? <laughs> they're treated like garbage, unfortunately, around here. Yeah. But they're awesome species. I don't know why people don't like them. You won't? Yeah. yeah like, uh, and for those of you who uh, might have not come across them before, I don't know of many fisheries inland that you do find them in. Uh, mostly Great Lakes. Um, yeah, I'll agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are definitely some inland fisheries, but not much around here. But yeah, if you get into them, they're, they're a hoot for sure. And they get big. Big fish. And anywhere in the Great Lakes, like Georgian Bay, yeah. you can easily buy 15, 20 pound fish. They tend to be a little bit deeper water. Sometimes you'll see that next drop off. Yeah. But if you have a selection of clouser minnows on you, which bring some bass flies with you and throw a clouser at them, they're probably going to eat. Um, yeah. They'll also eat carp flies, but uh, they love, I don't know, bucktail clousers. Uh, they just love them. Yeah. They really love they are predatory fish. Like they will chase bait fish. Um, back in the day when I when I did a lot more fishing, like conventional, we would even go and follow the target walleye and bayaquini. And you're trolling big crankbaits for walleye, and you're catching these giant sheephead. And you knew the minute it was a sheephead because it fought. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to tie another fly called the carp bitter. Uh, this one's been around a while. Um, an awesome damsel imitation. Uh, actually, let's just put it in before you see it ahead of time. Um, this actually works really well as a trout fly too. Uh, I catch a lot of still water trout on this fly, uh, spe specifically in smaller sizes, like this is a size 12. Um, I'm going to tie three to those three different sizes today so you kind of get an idea of the range. And then with a really small black bead chain eyes, these aren't mono eyes, they're bead chains, so a little bit of weight. Um, similar to the first pattern in the way it's tied, however, the rubber legs are just in a different position uh, and it provides a different profile. Uh, a little bit longer because uh, the rubber legs extend past the hook bend, but it rides a little bit more of a wiggle down there for them. Uh, fish it very, very slow. Damselflies aren't the fastest swimmers, but they are very prolific, prof uh, proficient hatch, and you'll see damsels all over the place when you're fishing for carp, uh, as you do often on trout rivers too. A little, they're the blue guys you see flying around, blue or green or black, flying around. They look like a dragonfly. They've only got two wings that tent over the back versus splitting it horizontally when they land. Um, and a lot of fish just love them. I mean, you can't blame them. They're easy to eat, uh, and they come in a wide range of colors, but the nymphs are almost always olive. So, tie it in olive. So, we're going to do the same marabou tail, tie it in short. Oh, I just nicked the hook point. Maybe the thread will break again. Great. <laughs> there we go. So, nice and short. I'm going to wrap that forward. Is this, uh, Chris, on your end? Mm -hmm. This is a 12. Can you see it okay? I can. Um, I don't know exactly what the stream's looking like on YouTube right now. I would imagine it's decent quality. It'll probably be better once we upload it. But no, okay. as far as I can see, it's great quality. We're tying yeah. for snipping it off. Question for you, Matt. You ever use, yeah. um, like you're talking a lot about waiting for these fish, but you know some fisheries you know, sometimes find slightly less accessible. Uh, waters, you know, still might be flats environments, maybe you can't walk there for some reason. Do you use boats much, you know, stand-up paddle boards, kayaks, things like that? 
I use my fishing kayak and my paddleboard a lot for these. Um, I do find it easier to approach them though. On, yep. I have caught fish from my kayak and, and board. Not gonna lie, and often in water that's a little bit too deep to wade. It might be five, six feet deep, still deep enough that you can clearly see the fish feeding. Um, I like wading because there's a lot less to tangle on, <laughs> right? If you use a board or a kayak, like limit the gear you bring or keep it all behind you or use a wading basket or you know, build a stripping mat of some sort to keep your line managed properly. Um, it's key because I've seen, you know, them get tangled in my kayak and almost break fly lines. So um, you don't want to do that. Yep. Um, yeah, definitely possible. I do find though, when I'm in one of my favorite areas to fish and I'm out in my kayak, Chasing them, um, the shadows of the boat can really spook them. Yeah, you won't be able um, to get quite as close. I mean, it's the same as waiting for bonefish. Waiting can always get way closer, right? You want to be cognizant of how, which way the sun is, which way on your back. Um, one point I didn't talk about, uh, you want to be looking uh, with the sun. You don't want to be looking at the sun. So try to keep your sun at your back because yeah. it allows you to see further. Or if you look towards the sun, you're going to diminish your view by like, 80%. Like it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, so try to not in mind work with the wind, um, which is nice. Uh, you can actually see into the backs of the waves a little bit easier than you can the fronts of the wave. Um, but yeah, so just be very cautious of boat shadow, I would say. Uh, and then it just may require a little bit further cast. Yeah. And so noise is a consideration too, right? Like noise really reverberates through the, um, through a boat as well. So you know, just be quiet. It might be a, a good idea for those of you who have an idea of an area you want to check out, get to by boat, you know, anchor the boat on shore kind of thing, see if you can wade up to the fish. Might be a, a good yeah. idea when possible. I'm often wading in muck that's like over my knees in the water. Mm -hmm. Like it's not pleasant wading. Like I'll be straight up with everybody. <laughs> it's uh, These carp often live, the big beautiful carp often live in the dirtiest places, you know, when it comes to muck. Um, so you'd be standing in areas where you're sinking down halfway up your chin to your knee um, and be cautious while moving, you know, you don't want to t turn really hurt yourself. Um, but uh, yeah, like a lot of areas I didn't think were possible to wait. Eventually you sink far enough down <laughs> into the muck that you hit a solid piece of bottom <laughs> and you can stand there. Um, but uh, yeah, waiting is my favorite for sure. If you can use a boat to get to some of these flats and locations, um, it's ideal because some of them are uh, accessible by land. Um, due to private property or whatever, that's why I bring my kayak. Um, but the water is public property, so let's get out there. You're good to go. So I'm tying in uh, silicone rubber legs again at the back here. This one's kind of got a bit of um, you know, the squint fly, right, Kurt? Mm -hmm. Sure. Kind of has a bit of a feeling like that because then you fold the rubber back and tie it in again mm -hmm. uh, on the side. But you tie this one in much shorter. Like you only want. You want the one leg to extend about the plank shank and then the next one to extend just to the tail. Sure. And damsels have a really, like when you see them, see a nymph in the wild, like their, their tails are really obvious. Um, I don't know if this adds a little bit of extra movement. I mean, their tails aren't quite this long, but they're a long bodied nymph. That's really key. Um, this hook shank's relatively short, but I think this rubber helps extend the profile and make it look like these could actually be like represent the gills on the fly often. And then that would be like the tail, the tip of the tail on a damsel. Great uh, panfish fly too. So yep. there's yeah. we're happy around, but they'll destroy this thing. Okay. Uh, so again, body, this time we're going to go with uh, some next favorite color, olive ice dub. Uh, it's got a really good UV finish. This one's got a lot of brown mixed in with it as well. It's not quite just all olive. It creates a nice looking fly. I use that for a lot of patterns. A little bit of dubbing wax again. And I should stipulate, like, these are my probably my three most productive flies. So if you had to have three flies in your box, You've got something that's a kind of a do-it-all, uh, the carp dragon. Uh, you've got a specific, like almost a streamer, like a crayfish pattern fish. Differently, you can also represent uh, a goby or a sculpin equally. And then they're probably their favorite food is the damselfly. So you got one that represents a damsel really well. And damselflies and dragonflies love mucky bottoms. They really bury in there and feed. They're both... Actually, is it damsel predatory? I can't remember, Chris. I know dragons are predatory, but 
Dragons are flying in Predatory? Dragons definitely are. I honestly can't remember on damsels. Yeah, because um, dragons will have like little small bait fish. Yeah, they're like stoneflies. Oh, well, not, yeah, maybe even a little bit more so. But um, I don't think damsels are, but I could be very wrong on that. If anyone knows, please correct me. All right. Again, hen hackle provides lots of movement with minimal material. Let me give that a snap. And a lot of people, I see a lot of carp patterns, like crayfish patterns, involve hen hackle as the claws. I haven't yet to find out if that makes a difference or not. Um, I like to keep them simple. Crayfish patterns can get really complex. Look, most fish and carp, particularly, keep it simple, you'll do really well. All about profile, it's been great. <laughs> Uh, there's a few straight fibers, I'm just going to stroke back, tie in behind the head, give you nice buggy legs, and then just finish it a little bit more, dab wrapped throughout. There's a, a new technical work in these patterns, Chris, over the last couple of years, um, and it involves suspending this pattern um, in front of carp by using a bit of a drop shot technique. Okay. So are you using a second so I, fly for the weight on the bottom or? I use, no, I use a, just this fly because usually the, the weight, the weight is going to be in the muck mm -hmm. and I don't want to be fouling up in the mud all the time. Sure. So I'll tie this in um, and then I'll leave a big long tag end, maybe six, eight inches mm -hmm. uh, to like a BB split shot. And I'll actually drop that, like cast and drag it towards them and keep yeah. it off the bottom. I can keep it there. You can just twitch it just ever so little and those legs just dance. Yep. And it's it's really cool. I'm actually thinking of another technique that'll involve um, making it look like it's emerging. Uh, that one's kind of hush hush right now. I gotta get it gotta get it locked down. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's what it does when you suspend in front of them. You can twitch it and it uh, at a distance, like under the rod tip. You can totally do that, no problem. But if you're casting at 15, 20 feet, sure. and you won't suspend that fly in front of them. A drop shot actually yeah. works pretty well. Yeah. And if anyone's, I just, if anyone's unfamiliar with uh, the drop shot terminology, because that comes from uh, spin fishing, the drop shot yeah. be weight on the bottom and your fly above. So he's talking yeah. about putting your fly on a dropper tag up here and then having some split shots. So you can just kind of dangle it a little off bottom at controlled distance. That's great. Cool. Right, right based. Uh, the great thing is a lot of people when they drop shot will tie in an overhand knot and then their split shot and that way the split shot doesn't come off. Mm -hmm. um, you just clip the split shot on and I'm not afraid to lose it because yeah. when a fish runs, I want that split shot to get caught in the weeds and just fall off. Yeah. Um, you know, you can use uh, like tin based split shot if you're concerned about lead in the water, um, which a lot of people are. So that's a great option. Um, I've even seen guys just use like a tungsten bead uh, with an overhand knot. Works pretty well. It's just expensive, you know, when you lose one. <laughs> Yeah, tin, tin split shot works really well for it, and it gets it down, uh, and when they run, it just falls off the line. No problem. So yeah, nice. that's the cart builder. Um, awesome damsel representation. Biggest thing you'll notice, these are all quick ties. Like, when I'm actually tying with a camera in front of me, these are a couple minutes max per pattern. Um, you're going to break off a lot of flies, um, so don't don't spend too much time tying each pattern. Yeah, that's a great tip, I think, for anyone, for any fish. <laughs> yeah. um, Patrick uh, was curious, he spoke a little to leaders earlier, um, he was wondering if you could go a little more in depth on leader, if you make any modifications of length of tippet in order to make sure your fly is fishing on the bottom or in the range that you want. Sure, yeah, um, I run short tippet, I would say maximum like 20, 24 inches, like it's not that long, two feet. Um, this isn't like fishing a sink tip or a sinking line where you only want four feet a leader, so that way um, you want that fly to kind of like pop off the bottom as you lift and the floating really long leader, like, your uh, leader will allow you to do that because of whoop. So your fly will be on the bottom, your tip it maybe four carbon or bottom to the fly. Um, when you lift it, that fly is going to lift and hop. That's really what you're looking for. Again, that movement is what's going to attract the fish. Um, so keep your your leaders, you know, having them relatively nine foot like average is okay. Um, for really tight, muddy situations in the weeds, and if you're not able to get on top of them because maybe there's no structure in between you and the fish, it's just mud and uh, Maybe your shadow is casting over them and you need to make a 20, 30 foot cast. Oftentimes I'll have people take um, like a normal nine foot knotless leader and trim it back to like three or four feet long. 
to a fly on 12 inches of tippet. So now you've only got a four to five foot leader, which allows for really accurate presentation. Um, the longer the leader, the harder it is to get an accurate presentation. Then you'll take it at the last moment, the way your leader um, rolls out, the way it turns over your fly is a little different. Um, so you can modify um, and keeping it simple is great. So uh, just buy yourself a handful of uh, you know, not less nine foot leaders, 15 pound. I usually tie a tippet ring onto them. Then I can use the same leader for many, many times. It also is a stronger connection. Uh, then if you just use like a uni, uni knot or a blood knot or anything like that, the breaking strength of two overhand knots is uh, stronger than one of those. No line rub. Uh, also, I found, I don't know, I've heard of this, um, when if you're running mono and fluorocarbon, oftentimes the, it will break a lot easier at a lower rate. Um, no? Yeah, no. <laughs> if you see it okay. well, shouldn't be, shouldn't be an issue. I think, um, yeah, there may be certain knots, I present issues yeah. because um, so mono does better with um, with like slide knots that don't pinch the actual material because it's a softer material. Mm -hmm. Fluorocarbon yeah. can do better sometimes with um, like strangle knots. Um, oh, okay. Try like your clinches and stuff. It's a little harder right. and it can be slippier. So there are I think better knots to use sometimes, but yeah. it's very doable. Yeah, and right. most of your standard knots should work fine. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. A lot of tippet makes it simple. Um, clip on, clip right. off. Shorten your shorten your tippet really simply. Uh, and you can use the same leader for you know. And that goes with all all uh, techniques. Most of them use tippet rings. Um, yeah, wicked. So, um, so you mentioned you fish Georgian Bay quite a bit. Uh, we fish Lake Ontario quite a bit, and around the islands, Tommy Thompson, Parrot, a lot of places, Hamilton Harbor. There are a lot of places around here with these fish, um, finding places to fish. I mean, so um, first off, what, what wow. kinds of waters? If somebody's not familiar with these waters, what are they looking for to find a potential? Carp will live anywhere, which is pretty cool. Um, so chances are, if it's water and it doesn't get into, you know, that night, like the whole pond doesn't get into the 90 degree range in the summer, it's probably going to have carp now. You know, they were introduced way back in the day and they migrated all the way to the state. Uh, they are using it um, adapting to any situation that they need to be in. Mm -hmm. um, so don't, just keep in mind though, the larger body of water, the larger the fish. So if you are looking for those 20, 30 pound fish it is going to be a big river system or the Great Lakes. Uh, Lake Simcoe has giant fish as well. Uh, like Orchids. Orchids. Things like There's a big forage base and a lot of area for them to move. Um, but local ponds and stuff often have large numbers of carp. Um, one in like, I used to live down in the Newmarket area called Ferry Lake. Um, yeah. Full, full of carp, and they're all like two to six pounds. Um, and it's super muddy water, but if you just, you know, a lot of guys in there are bait fishing with corn, but if you just walk slowly along the bank, um, you'll see the dead giveaways. You'll see the tail poke up. Uh, you'll see reeds kind of twitch, nervously twitch, because the fish has bumped it. Um, and if you're fishing a foot of water, even though it's muddy, you have four to five inches of visibility, you'll often their back, their dorsal fin, something like that. In the muddy water, though, it's very important to try to take your time and uh, locate which end of the fish is the actual head. Mm. That's a key key point because if you're targeting the tail, it's not going to see your fly. So, <laughs> sure. um, um, so no, I usually, you know, I love the Great Lakes just because the average size of the fish and the opportunities for you know, their species is, is out there. Um, but any lake, basically in Southern Ontario, anything that's on the Trent Severn Waterway has a lot of carp in them. And that will be um, the fourth is for... People who may be more familiar with that term. So yeah, so Trent Severn runs all the way from I believe it's like Kingston Mills all the way up to Georgian Bay. So it goes through the Cork Lakes, down into Lake Simcoe, up into Lake Kuchiching, and then out into some of the lakes into Muskoka, and then dumps into Georgian Bay. Like yeah. uh, uh, it'll go the other way, but yes. Yeah, it pulls the other way. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, correct. <laughs> um, but yeah, those systems all have. Um, a lot of carp. Uh, even if anybody was familiar with it, about hmm, eight or nine years ago, there was a large um, carp die-off in the in the not chain of lakes in our most of southern Ontario due to a virus that was found, like a carp-specific virus, koi virus. Um, but they've rebounded, right? The carp are uh, for a few years. It was kind of slow. There wasn't many of them, but they've come back. They were really resilient. Um, if you're fishing in Toronto, the harbor, the islands, super clear water. Go for a ferry ride over to Center Island and just walk along uh, the shoreline slowly. 
Yeah. Um, even offshore, like you don't have to get wet. Um, it's good if you do. Water's <laughs> warm enough. Uh, you know, wet wade is great. Um, I uh, often will use the same clothing that I'll wear in the salt. Um, I'll often tuck um, my pants into my wading socks, though, and my boots, just to keep up the mud, silt, and well, creepy crawlies, like the leeches and stuff you might find uh, in there, moving on. Um, but not too many of those to worry about. It depends on your body. Uh, yeah, take a look at Google Maps. There's a lot of lakes out there. Go explore. And usually on Google Maps, like especially in these clear bodies of water, it's pretty obvious weightable areas. Like, uh, you know, if you look around Lake Ontario, Georgia Bay, especially as an example, again, just because of how clear they are, you know, the, the flats areas really show up very easily, right? Like in around, if you're local yeah. to Toronto, um, you know, Toronto Islands, um, you know, Tommy Thompson Point, Humber Bay Park, these areas, it's pretty obvious. Um, you know, I guess in the Carth is maybe a little less so, but, you know, if you look at the shallow or weedy areas, that's, I'd say, a good place to start. Um, Bay of Quiddy, great place for yep. anyone if you're out, uh, out east. A uh, lot of little back bays and stuff out there with good fish. Um, mm -hmm. Anywhere else? If you had to think of, I mean, re really, I think the, the dividing line in my mind is that sort of Trent Severn waterway. So that's like, we're up around you, Aurelia kind of area. Um, on a slight angle down the trench, you know, toward Peterborough. Anything south of that, generally, I, I would say, seems to have them. Just in your little ponds in your neighborhood. Yeah. So I had a similar one like you in uh, in Richmond Hill, a stormwater pond that was just filled with the things. And yeah, they, they offer great opportunities when you can't get out somewhere more exotic, right? I'll see what's... Uh... And it's a good way to hone, you know, your presentation for saltwater. It's a good way to learn how to quietly and slowly because they are spooky. The lessons I've learned from carp have transferred into trout fishing and stuff on the rivers as well. Um, you know, there's a lot to learn from them. There's a lot to be appreciated. Uh, and they're lots of fun. They, I don't know any other fish in Ontario that will regularly take you 100 plus yards and you're packing <laughs> when it has to do with open water. It's, it's every other fish will do that, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> Pumps or anything? It's because they just weigh too much. <laughs> but they like to come to and splash around. Uh, I like to get down in the muck, uh, root around, get you tangled. And you know, some of these areas I fish, they really look like you're fishing the back of mangrove bays and stuff. Yeah. From you know, from Florida and, and, and anything like that where you, where you fish. Um, it's messy water. It's a lot of fun. It's got its own sense of you know, they've got their own sense of beauty um, and uh, they're hard to catch. And that's the best part. Everyone thinks they're easy. Um, you get out there and present to 50 fish and get skunked, you know, like they are. Um, yeah. Cool. Cool. And for guys that aren't uh, aren't tires as well, we do have tons and tons of carp flies uh, in shop as well. If anyone wants to give them a go, we've got all the gear you need as well. Uh, but pretty well all of it listed online. And, uh, and Matt, you are going to be instructing and taking uh, taking guide days this year with us as well, which is pretty yeah. exciting. Very excited for that. Yeah, it'll be an awesome opportunity to help connect with more people. I think there's a lot of people that are just, you know, getting the urge to get out and learn fly fishing. Uh, it's something you can do. We're lucky with it's real. We've got such a range of opportunities. Here's specific just trout. We've got dozens of fish species that can all be targeted on a fly, and they're all different. It keeps it fun. Um, I love about it. So you got a lot in your own backyard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well worth taking advantage of. And I think you made a great point at the top of the show too. Um, you know, just like, like I say, we have a pretty short trout season realistically in southern Ontario. A few months, sort of start of the year, tail end in September. You know, this is an awesome opportunity for people who you know want to still get out through the summer. Um, or on the flip side, for those who really do want to go down south. I think the parallels that you can draw between bonefish and permit and carp, they're just endless in terms of everything from the gear to the casting to the, you know, the specifics of really tuning everything in. It looks look like redfish when they're really. Yeah. You see the box and you, it'd be both big scaled fish, get similar sizes. The often, you know, sometimes when I've been down, you know, when I've been carp fishing, you're like, oh my God, you just have flashbacks like instant to redfish, right? Like it's, it's tough to be. Tough to be. Um, one other thing, real quick. Uh, Pulp my sunglasses, really key. Um, more so than ever, I think, because you're sight fishing, you need to see every fish before you present to them. Do not, there's no need to band cast, just cast randomly because you're just going to inevitably spook a fish because you're going to land it on them. 
Um, and light colored clothing for your top, but make sure it has a good SPF rating. Um, a lot of shirts, like Sims of Patagonia, make the shirts with the hoods that pop up. You've got your back and the neck protection with the ball cap. Um, it's all good to keep flies out of your head and eyes as well. Because um, casting the short line can be pretty tricky sometimes. You pick it up and the flies will look like Awesome. Don't be afraid to buddy. It's the best part. <laughs> yeah. Who wouldn't, want... Screen, Who wouldn't want? Screen. <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't want to feel like a kid again rolling around the mud? <laughs> awesome. Cool. So if anyone uh, does want to take advantage of your services this coming year, obviously not doing much right now, but coming up May, June, carp season, trout season, um, they can contact you or or through the shop. Yeah, uh, I'd say yeah, probably easiest stuff. Uh, just wants to you know message shop, email shop. We can put you in touch with Matt, get you out on the water for sure. Matt is going to be leading a number of um, instructional sessions with us this year as well on water stuff, intro stuff. Um, so yeah, he's got a whole bag of tricks to share, obviously, and uh, yeah, excited to have him. Well, great. Thanks for really to uh, you know show off some carp flies, talk about one of my favorite species, and uh, definitely an underrated game fish. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. This is gonna be posted to our um, our YouTube channel. It'll be saved up there, so if you guys tuned in late, you can rewatch it. Um, if you have any other questions, you can message you know, myself, Matt, whatever. We'll, we'll be happy to, have, to try and help you out afterwards as well. Um, yeah, we have another one coming up uh, next Thursday. Not with Matt. Uh, we've got check the calendar here. Who do we have? We have so many coming up here. Next week we have Mike. Mike's one of our other uh, tying ambassadors here at the shop. We're really, to ha really happy to have him. He's going to do some trout flies for us. So make sure to tune in for that. That's next Thursday, 7 p.m. After work for you guys, we'll be posting about that as well. And uh, maybe we can have you back soon, Matt. <laughs> That'd be good. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining. And uh, yeah, we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. All Take right. care. See you guys.